When's the last time you went for groceries? Like most Canadians, it probably doesn't require much planning on your part. If you're in a major city, there's a grocery store pretty close to where you live. And shopping's probably just another activity that you take for granted. I recognize that even in Canada, there are people that struggle to put food on the table or have further distances to travel to fill a shopping cart. In fact, there's some unsettling statistics here in Canada. One in eight households are considered food insecure. Food insecurity can range from running out of food in between shops to going without meals to going hungry. In our Canadian context, these challenges tend to be economic. It's not that there isn't enough food, but there is inequity around who gets that food. Even before the global pandemic, the developing world was seeing an increase in food insecurity issues. These range from climate events, armed conflicts, locusts, and now the overlay of the global pandemic. The United Nations is warning of a possible catastrophic food crisis in the developing world. However, there still is time to take action on behalf of those facing hunger. There are signs of hope, and we're going to be looking at those today on Mosaic. Today on Mosaic Magazine, we're going to be discussing the ways that CBM and our partners are working together to respond to the needs of a hungry world. I'll introduce you to some key staff who are on the front lines with these programs, and we'll speak with a Canadian farmer and find out how they too are responding to the needs of an increasingly hungry world. The first person we need to speak to is Julia Bowering. Julia is the team lead for the International Partnerships Program at CBM. Let's meet Julia. Hi, Julia. Hi, Gordon. I wonder if you could help us uh, understand a little bit more of the changes that have taken place in the last little while for CBM and its programs. Well, around mid-March last year, about the time that I started in this role at CBM, all of our partners went into a lockdown situation of some sort around the world. And so all of our programming almost overnight was impacted in some way by these lockdowns and by the pandemic that was just starting to ramp up around the world. But because our partners work in different contexts, different countries and regions around the world, the programming that we had planned to do and budgeted for, it wasn't all impacted in the same way. So we have some partners who were able to continue on with much of their planned programming. So for instance, some of our partners that work in East Africa, particularly in rural regions, were able to keep going with their projects. You could still dig wells. There weren't as many movement restrictions for people, so they could still tend you know, test gardens and work on conservation agriculture techniques. But then some of our partners were in cities and more urban areas where movement restrictions were pretty extreme. And so many of our partners had to adapt their programming. So for instance, our partner LSESD in Lebanon does a day camp for kids in the Syrian refugee camps. And they transitioned their whole programming because they couldn't gather together for a camp to camp in a box. And it was a tremendous amount of work, but they had such an incredible impact through doing camp virtually and even developing some online resources. And then some of our partners, for the sake of safety of field staff and government regulations, had to go on hold completely. So it was, it was quite the year, um, and everyone was experiencing the same thing, but in a slightly different way. So at the same time that this was unfolding with our normal programs, we also had or our planned programming our relief programs started to go through the roof so actually julia let me let me ask you this uh what's a typical year look like emergency wise for cbm's programs so typically we would tend to do about eight to ten projects uh emergency relief projects these are projects we haven't planned they arise due to a crisis that has come up and we respond like Beirut blast, earthquake, some sort of major event that that no one no one saw coming. Exactly. So in 2020, instead of doing nine to 
10 relief projects. We did 34. Um, so this was a really different situation. Yeah, that's more like a slow onset emergency as COVID-19 spread around the globe and we were seeing the impacts in communities. That's kind of where we're at now too, in that we're still in the middle of a crisis, but it's this long, um, drawn out crisis. And so we know more emergency relief is coming, but we also have the chance to plan for it a little bit um, and to try and look forward and say, how can we help our partners? How can we support them to address some of the things that are going to arise or we think might arise. Yeah, so this, so now as we kind of enter, well, year two uh, of this pandemic carrying on, the partners must be in a different place yeah, as ter in terms of your programming for, for the year ahead of us. What does that look like? Well, many of our partners have already been doing projects that address food insecurity. Um, and as we know, food insecurity isn't something that just exists in a vacuum by itself. It, it's has to do with issues of justice, with conflict, with gender equity, with creation care, discipleship and spiritual formation. There's so many other factors that are linked to the way that food is distributed and who has access to it. So as our partners are looking towards this coming year, their programs are holistic. Uh, many of them are continuation of projects that they were doing before, but addressing the issues that the pandemic has just increased and and exacerbated. So Gordon, knowing that we were going to have this conversation today, I reached out to a couple of our colleagues last week who I think can help us understand what we're talking about in two specific contexts. So first I reached out to our colleague Polisi, who is our expert in relief and development in East Africa. Well, hi, Polisi. It's great to see you. Thank you for joining me this afternoon um, to talk a little bit more about food security issues uh, coming out of last year. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about how you have seen the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, issues like climate change, conflict, impact food security in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Thank you, Julia. I think the effect is both economic and psychosocial. Uh, on the economic level, you see, uh, it is true that farmers in the rural areas are still going to the field, but they don't produce everything they need. They still need uh, food commodities from outside, oil, salt, and, and, uh, and even uh, rice and other uh, food stuff which came from foreign countries and now since the borders are still closed uh, they are still in need of such commodities but in the cities for example people lived on the, a daily basis you know the level of unemployment so people lived on uh, informal activities carrying uh, lo uh, loads or cross-border informal business across the borders so all those activities were closed and uh, people were affected. I mentioned also a, socio, a, psych, a, a, a sociological impact. You know, there is a wrong uh, attitude where people say wrongly that elderly people are more likely to carry the virus than the youth. So this is creating a kind of uh, traumatizing situation for elderly people who are afraid they live with fear, uh, but also with a kind of uh, marginalization because it is a, let's say, a marginalizing situation when, when you, you, you are considered to be a potential carrier of the virus. So how has the Sebeka been addressing some of these issues through uh, CBM partnered projects and, and through some of our CBM work through the CFGB as well? Yeah, it's a good thing that we started with the food security projects even long before the pandemic, because you see some of our, our projects have been there for three, four, five years, and they have already started making a change in the places where the church is operating because of these food security projects. And uh, the strength of a food security project is capacity building because that is what makes it different from food distribution. It helps to reduce dependency, 
but it uh, reinforces the capacity of farmers and uh, this uh, makes them uh, secure about themselves when we train them to find solutions to their own needs then it becomes sustainable even when the project is finished and when some, someone has uh, produced something him or herself he or she is proud of it I'm always happy when I visit the village and someone tells me hey look here are your cassava here are your bananas they, they are mine actually it means this is what you have taught me to produce well, Polisi, thank you so much for your time, for helping us understand these issues a little bit more, and for the encouraging stories that are coming out of the Democratic Republic and from our partner, the Sebeka. Well, that is very encouraging. Thank you, Julia, for speaking with Polisi. It's amazing to see conservation agriculture uh, changing communities and people's lives. Yeah, thank you very much. It was so encouraging to have that conversation. And I wanted to get another take from a really different context. So I also chatted with Michael Waddell, who is, as you know, our field staff who works with our partner KPM in the Philippines. And this is what Michael had to share. Well, Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about how COVID-19 and other factors such as uh, conflict and climate change have impacted food security in the Philippines and particularly in the area where CBM's partner KPM works. Many people maybe don't know this, but the Philippines has had the longest lockdown uh, over the pandemic out of any country in the world. It's still in, in many ways in lockdown in various regions today, which early on meant that uh, even farmers were not allowed to leave their homes to go to their fields to, to work, to, to tend to their crops, to take care of their animals. And so those types of things uh, made life very difficult for farmers who already struggle uh, in many ways in the Philippines, because uh, when there's no pandemic, they're always having to deal with issues of, of climate change and soil degradation, uh, things like typhoons, other natural calamities, uh, flash flooding, droughts sometimes. It's just uh, the Philippines is one of the, the most prone countries in the world to natural calamities. And so those things on top of COVID-19 have made uh, yeah farming and food security really quite a challenge in the Philippines. It's really neat to hear the stories that come out of these projects as well. And can you tell us a little bit more about some of the challenges that farmers face in the Philippines? Like, for instance, financing um, a farm and small business where you know where do you get a loan and how does that um how does that challenge their ability to create food um and yeah can, tell us a little bit more about that yeah yeah that's a that's a very big uh question really because when we began working with kpm uh many you know four or five years ago kpm one of the first things they asked us to assist them with was the food for life initiative and it was all about helping farmers uh, at that time get out of cycles of debt that they were caught up in. It was quite common in the Philippines for, for poor rural farmers uh, to go to loan sharks who, you know, in the Philippines, loan sharks, probably much like other countries, they are charging, uh, you know, ridiculous interest rates. They're exploiting the farmers. They are controlling the harvests. They are controlling the price. Uh, but farmers, you know, who are poor and don't have the, the finances to go fund their own uh, farm inputs and their own harvesting, they were really relying on these loan sharks to to fund their, their farms, to fund their work. But what would happen is they would get caught in these cycles because if their crop, if their yield was low or if it got wiped out by an insect or by a typhoon, well, the loan sharks didn't care. They still came with their hands out and they were still expecting payment which oftentimes that payment came in the form of rice. It would like they would take the harvest. So sadly, uh, in countries like the Philippines, the people who grow our food, the farmers, they are often the ones who are the ones going without food. And that is certainly the case in the Philippines is that many, many farmers were struggling to put food on their own tables, uh, struggling to have enough rice or other crops to sell to be able to provide 
for other essential needs like education, school for their kids or medical expenses. So one of the ways that Food for Life addressed that was that Food for Life actually, when I mentioned that they are now producing these chemical free farm inputs, that is so that these farmers don't have to go to the loan sharks anymore. Food for Life is now actually uh, structured in such a way that all of the Food for Life farmers are able to access the farm inputs that they need directly from the Food for Life program. And then the Food for Life program works with them throughout the whole uh, planting, the whole season of growth, and then the harvest time. Food for Life purchases their rice at a fair price that gives them you know, a, a good uh, wage for what the work that they've done for the crop that they've grown. And then they sell the rice to customers, whether it's in Roja City or throughout communities in Capiz province. And so that's one of the ways that we've sort of addressed a very challenging situation with these loan sharks, uh, which is, you know, really just an awful situation. And many, many farmers are still caught up in it today. And it, it definitely adds to uh, issues of food security in the Philippines. Well, Michael, thank you so much for sharing with us today from the Philippines, um, from your experience there. I know you're in Canada waiting to go back, but uh, we so appreciate that. So thanks, thanks for giving us a glimpse into that work. Well, wow, that is uh, really something to hear from Michael and to hear about the situation um, in the Philippines. So not only do you have a global pandemic and uh, struggling as a farmer already, but these loan shark practices and taking advantage of people that are already in a disadvantaged uh, situation is really, uh, it's really something to hear. Well, Julie, I want to actually uh, move almost, well, move back to Canada. Uh, Polisi mentioned uh, the Food Grains Bank CBM is one of the 15 members of the Food Grains Bank. Each member organization has their own account, and there is also a general account available to all members. Money in the accounts comes from growing projects, individuals, churches, and other groups. The Canadian government also contributes, providing the Food Grains Bank with a matching grant of $25 million a year. Members can use donations for three kinds of programs, food assistance, agriculture and livelihoods, nutrition. When a member wants to do a project, it makes a proposal to the Food Grains Bank for funding. After receiving the proposal, the Food Grains Bank staff review and approve the projects. Once approved, food assistance or nutrition programs receive a four to one match. Agriculture and livelihood projects receive a three to one match. All other Food Grains programs are matched one to one. The combined funds are then sent to the member to implement the project in collaboration with partners in the developing world. So that hopefully explains how the Food Grains Bank uh, funds and operates uh, here in Canada and overseas. Thanks, Gordon. You know, this is my first year working with the Canadian Food Grains Bank, and it has been so cool to see 15 different agencies in Canada partnering across denominations to offer this collaborative, incredible support to our partners around the world. And uh, I just think it's such a beautiful example of Christians collaborating to see transformation in our world. Yeah, it really is an incredible organization. Now, let me introduce you to Jordan Weber. Jordan is uh, our board member, CBM's board member at the Food Grains Bank. And uh, I had a conversation with him last week about his family and their farm and the work that they're doing. And he has a little challenge for business owners. So why don't you take a look at this with me? Well, hello, Jordan. Thank you for joining us today. This is our first uh, Mosaic Magazine uh, video. So we are talking about hunger and I've just been explaining a little bit about uh, uh, the function and how the Food Grains Bank is, uh, is structured. Now, the reason you and I are talking is uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, your connection and your family's uh, connection to uh, to farming and, and to the Food Grains Bank. So thanks for being with us. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, yeah, our family's been connected to the Food Grains Bank for a long time. And it actually all started in the early 1980s when Canada was hearing a lot about the Ethiopian famine. That was a really, really big deal kind of in the world context. Oh. And so in 1983, which is actually oddly enough, the year I was born, my grandpa received a call and he 
answered that call to deliver grain to a Mennonite initiative two hours away from our farm. And he loaded up his grain truck and uh, he delivered it there and helped bag the grain onto trains. And uh, it actually got directly sent overseas to specifically uh, give to the Ethiopian famine relief effort. And so, yeah, that was a, that was a huge thing, a kind of a stake in the ground. And uh, that initiative became the Food Grains Bank. And uh, our community has donated grain each year ever since. In 1983, I was in college, and I remember, you know, I mean, being that, being that age, um, the uh, the songs coming out, the fundraising songs from the uh, "We Are the World" and and whatnot. So, uh, yes, I remember those days, and to think that uh, there was a family and Canadians were responding uh, while I was in college, and here we are talking together today. It's kind of funny. Um, so back then, you actually shipped food. Uh, food you shipped grain directly but um, a lot of the food grains bank projects now are not exactly about shipping food overseas no I mean um, you know to this day we still give grain um, but now it's a system where it goes to the elevator to the buyer and it's there it's converted to cash it creates a lot of efficiency um, and then as it's converted to cash uh, the food grains bank and through CBM and partners is able to use it where best and most effective around the world to source food locally for those needs. Can you explain how a grow project works and how I could become a virtual farmer with you? <laughs> yeah, um, how it works is uh, it's a really cool partnership where, you know, there's a lot of expenses and different logistics that go into farming and kind of how we set it up is the primary ones are rent so the cost of actually being able to utilize the land for farming and then the cost of inputs things like the actual seed to go in the ground and uh, the things that go in the ground with the seed to help it grow and so uh, you know those are those are really expensive each year to make that business work and so um, people partner with us to uh, buy the inputs or to pay for the rent and uh, as we and then as we grow through the season that partnership then the crop grows and gets harvested and the total amount of what's harvested on those acres gets donated and so through this virtual partnership uh you know we have people across canada that join with us in growing grain and then get to see the the, uh, the complete fruits of what gets to yeah. be done at the end so it's a really it's uh we've been honored over time to have people who are excited about farming, who, uh, who, you know, like seeing updates about the crop and how all that works, uh, partnering with us. It's been really cool. Yeah, my church has just taken on a um, supporting a grow project in Truro, uh, Nova Scotia. And so we're starting to hear reports of, of what part of the season we're in. And, uh, and then we'll be seeing what the support, the supporting funds that we've sent um, to actually farm and, and um, finance the inputs, as you mentioned, will be turning into funding that's going into the Canadian Food Grains Bank into CBM's account there. So you have actually a special challenge as well for um, to fellow business owners. So yeah, you know, it really comes from the fact that in Canada, we're so blessed, we have an abundance of resources to give, even sometimes like during COVID, we don't realize it. Um, but, you know, we need to realize the disparity around the world is really a problem, especially in terms of food security. Uh, we don't even comprehend the challenges that our brothers and sisters around the world are, are facing every day. So it's really a critical time to be given, to be giving. Um, so we want to challenge other farmers, but also business owners across Canada to give a small portion of your profit, one or two or 3% out of your annual operations to support the hungry. You know, a coffee shop could give the proceeds from 20 minutes of a day um, mm -hmm. uh, or a farmer could could pledge a few acres. We just, you know, there's an abundance. There's a resource there to give and there's so much need around the world. So what I'm calling is I, I'm calling you out that we are blessed to be a blessing. And uh, we think now is the time to really step into that calling. All right. All right. If you're a business owner, you've heard the challenge there from Jordan to uh to consider a way in which you could take a, a portion of your profits or a portion of a day's sales, something like that, and uh, 
I'll make sure that there's a link below that people can, uh, can connect as to where they could make that donation uh, into CBM's uh, Food Grains Bank account. Yeah. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks for being with us today. We'll look forward to hearing your report on, uh, on uh, how the farming is going. I know there's a number of churches and people that are connected way out here in Ontario, all the way back to you in, in Brownfield, Alberta, and they'll be looking forward to, to seeing how this season does. So thank you again. My pleasure. Wow, what an incredible family legacy. So glad that we got to hear more about that. And I just love that challenge to Canadian businesses. So cool. I want to share this video now. And this is uh, our boss and her appeal to Canadians and to Canadian Baptists uh, to respond with generosity. As I think about feeding my family, being unable to put food on the table never really crosses my mind. I'm thankful for secure income and easy access to food in my neighborhood. I can't imagine what it's like being a parent that has to send my child to sleep without food for yet another day, or a farmer who harvests crops but can't afford to put food on my own table. In the most vulnerable communities in the world, where even farmers are hungry, there is cause for alarm. It is a grave indicator of an impending food crisis. It is so hard to accept that over 800 million people today will be undernourished, just like they were yesterday. Tragically, that number will continue to climb as this pandemic and pre-existing factors such as conflict and extreme poverty and other diseases will combine to increase the vulnerability of the bottom billion. But there is hope. And here is how you can make a difference today. With this year's matching grant opportunity, every dollar raised will be matched by the Canadian government through the Canadian Food Grains Bank, as well as a dear friend of CBM who cares deeply about the needs of the world's poorest people. This is Elisi. She's a small-scale farmer living in Rwanda who was assisted through our food programming. She has received training and support in conservation agriculture, and she's seen her farm yields increase this has empowered her and increased her income as she supports her family and contributes to the stability of her community. Despite losing her husband and her child, Lisi is a resilient and resourceful woman, just like so many of the people we work with. She says this, the training helped me to improve the soil of my land and to reduce my farming costs. I fertilize with organic compost and I can produce it myself. I also learned about varieties of trees that are good to plant and how to improve the soil further. I can see the difference. Jesus is being merciful in my life. What an incredible statement from Elise. Despite the hardships that she has faced, she is grateful for how God has worked in her life. Elise's life has improved because of a few faithful donors just like you at CBM, we will continue to support people like Elise who live on the margins. But we need your help to continue feeding the most vulnerable in Jesus' name. In places such as South Sudan, the Philippines, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, we want to see them reach the same level of success that Elise has managed and to do it all with dignity. I want to ask you today to say yes to this matching donation opportunity. Through your support, CBM will be able to double the impact of your giving, making its reach go even further in a hungry world. You can take action right now on this page through the link below. Thank you for your generous support, your ongoing partnership with us in God's work of transforming the lives of people and communities is critical. Together, may we continue to embrace a broken world through word and deed. Well, I think that's probably a fitting place to wrap up our conversation, Julia. But uh, I want to give people some opportunities to explore this further uh, outside of this call. And uh, do you have any resources that you would point people to? Well, Gordon, there are so many great resources out there, but one that I found really interesting is by the World Food Program, and it's this online live hunger map. 
So you can go to it and you can click on a particular country or region and you get st the most recent statistics on hunger and food security, as well as information about other factors that are impacting hunger in that area, say conflict. Um, or environmental degradation. So it's a great way to learn more about what's going on around the world in regards to hunger. One of the other important things we should point out about the Food Grants Bank is the um, advocacy work. That is a huge part of what the Food Grants Bank does on behalf of the hungry around the world. It encourages Canadians to take part and take action and to let their members of parliament know that food and hunger issues are important to them and they have a lot of resources there on the website that your small group could take advantage of or you can take advantage of as a voting citizen in Canada. And Harvest of Letters is coming up and those resources are available on their site. So please have a look at that and see what you can do right from your home with a pen and a stamp and sending that off to your member of parliament. You can find books that they've recommended, small group studies, there are films, documentaries. So check it out, uh, fantastic learning resources. Yes, and please consider uh, your financial support and how you can lend it to this campaign that we're running presently and uh, that your funds are being matched a dollar for dollar through the Food Grains Bank and through our generous uh, private donor. So take advantage of that. I'm putting a link below and you can click on that link and make your donation online right now. Julia, thank you so much. Thank you for helping me tour around these issues and tour around the globe with me. And uh, really appreciate uh, all the work that uh, your team is doing. And this has been an unusual year indeed to uh, start a new job. <laughs> so thank you for being with me here. I will look forward to time together when we're working together uh, in the office um, and just down the hall from each other. So you too. Thank thanks so much. You. And thank you. Thanks for joining us here on uh, Mosaic Magazine. This is our first edition of a video uh, Mosaic Magazine. I hope you enjoyed it. It will not be the last. If you're looking, as ever, for more information about CBM, you can find it on our website at cbmin.org. Thanks for joining us today. Bye for now. <laughs>